Well, thank you and uh, good afternoon. I'm going to be talking today a, a little bit different talk, I think, where the focus is going to be more on hardware, uh, which is a little bit different for a software conference. Um, so we'll be talking about hardware and low-level programming, but as you'll see, I think there will be some relevance to Qt and some of the things that we typically do with Qt. Um, these are some of the topics I'm going to cover. I have a lot of slides, so I may gloss over some of the slides uh, in the interest of time. Uh, but you should be able to get access to the slides later if you want to go back to them after the conference and, and see the, the full detailed slides. Um, briefly about myself, I work for ICS, one of the uh, co-hosts of uh, Dev Days. We're also putting on the uh, Developer Days conference in San Francisco in about a month. So we're going to be uh, pretty busy, just like the Digio guys and KDEV guys here this week. Um, so I've been using Qt way back since Qt 1 dot something. Um, I work as a consulting manager, but still do some programming. Uh, my original background was an electrical engineer, so that, that helped a little bit with some of the concepts that I'll be talking about today. So let me give you a little bit of rationale behind this talk and why it's relevant. Um, if you've been using Qt for a number of years, like, um, like myself and some others, uh, originally, Qt was more of a cross-platform uh, desktop uh, environment, so most of us were doing desktop applications a number of years ago, um, and with um, the ownership by Nokia, a lot of the focus moved to mobile, so a lot of us had to make the shift over to mobile, understand the technologies related to the phone industry. Uh, but more recently, I think a lot of us have started working in the embedded side of things. Um, and that can offer some challenges if you have more of a pure computer science background and maybe aren't familiar with some of the lower level hardware concepts. There's some things there that uh, can be helpful to learn so you're more comfortable with hardware. Um, like me, a number of us may have had to start working with pieces of hardware from customers and hook up pieces of hardware. So hopefully this talk will help you understand some of the concepts and basics and some of the areas that um, you could increase your knowledge if you're going to be working with hardware. A little bit about history of where embedded systems went. Um, microprocessors started around the mid-70s. Uh, before that, uh, embedded systems were more kind of hard-coded logic and not programmable devices. Um, when microprocessors come, came out in the mid-70s and, and late 70s, then we started seeing 8- and 16-bit processors. Uh, at that time, mostly people were using assembly language and usually not running any kind of a real operating system, maybe a proprietary operating system of some type, or maybe no real operating system. Um, today, that's really um, changed a lot. We've, the, the average embedded system now is comparable to a desktop of a few, few years ago, or maybe even has um, more powerful hardware. We're seeing like 64-bit systems with multi-core, um, 3D acceleration, um, so things that, that were common on desktops a, a few years ago are now on even low-cost embedded systems. Uh, so we're seeing things like uh, a Raspberry Pi where you've got uh, a system with OpenGL, um, a Linux operating system for $35 US. Um, and typically today, most programming is done in higher level languages like C and C++ rather than assembly language. So I'm going to talk first a bit about some hardware concepts um, and then move into things a little more software related. So I thought I'd start with a bit about safety if you're going to be working with um, hardware and electronics. Um, some of us haven't really worked directly with this type of devices. So electricity in particular is something you should be aware of safety. Um, high voltage is a concern. Um, you know, high voltage can, can kill you. Anything over about 30 volts is considered potentially hazardous. And particularly here in Europe, uh, we're talking you know, 230 volts, uh, double that in North America. Um, high current can also be uh, dangerous. The uh, batteries have today have capability to put out a lot of energy. Um, so that's something to be uh, aware of with batteries, not shorting uh, devices like that, because that can be a safety hazard as, as well. Um, other hazards potentially are um, uh, different types of chemicals and things related to high temperature like soldering. Um, solder in, in general, lead-based solder is reasonably safe, but um, because of the impact on the environment, uh, most manufacturers have started moving away from, from lead-based solder. Uh, 
And another, it's sort of related to safety, but um, something to be aware of is ESD or electrostatic discharge. Um, semiconductors, things like integrated circuits and transistors can be uh, damaged by high voltages caused by uh, static electricity. Uh, so if you're going to be handling these types of devices, there's some practices you should follow. Um, use static safe packaging, um, the work mats, wrist straps, and so on, if you're going to be working particularly with components that haven't been installed in a board yet. Um, ESD can be a cause of kind of mysterious failures where something's working and then it stops working. Um, and it's particularly common in the winter when the humidity is low and encourages a buildup of static electricity. So let's talk a bit about some of the basics of electricity and electronics. Um, some of this may go back to things that you, you remember in school years ago. One of the basic formulas was Ohm's law that relates uh, current to voltage and resistance. Um, so given two of those, you can calculate the, um, the other parameter. Um, so sometimes Ohm's law is shown as a triangle with the different variations of, of Ohm's law. Um, but you, if you combine it with the formula for power, which is voltage times current, um, which gives you power, you can look at it as this wheel here where you can see the different combinations of formulas uh, to calculate anything based on other values. Um, so I is current, V is voltage. Sometimes it's it, the symbol E is used um, for electromotive force and R is resistance. Uh, so if you're making electrical measurements, which would be pretty common, maybe just measuring the output of a power supply or something like that. Some of the basics of using a multimeter. Um, we have a simple circuit here with a battery on the top and a resistor on the bottom. Uh, if you're measuring voltage, you measure the cross a device, you can apply the voltmeter across it, and the current meter has to be done in series by breaking the circuit. So the A there is a current or ammeter. Um, resistance is typically measured out of the circuit um, with the unit powered off. There's also, uh, it's also possible to measure some of the other parameters like capacitance, inductance with uh, appropriate devices. So some of the general types of electrical components, they're often divided into what are called passive components uh, that essentially uh, obey Ohm's law and are linear and active components um, that are nonlinear. So the common passive components would be resistors, capacitors, and inductors. Um, the units are listed here. Resistors, are, resistance is measured in ohms or um, multiples of ohms, or one ohm is a pretty low value. Uh, capacitance, the unit is the farad, which is actually a, a pretty large value, so usually talking microfarads, nanofarads. And inductance, the unit is the Henry. Uh, active components would be things like uh, going back a few years, vacuum tubes or valves. And then semiconductor diodes, light emitting diodes, uh, transistors, and integrated circuits. Um, Kind of a piece of trivia, you probably think vacuum tubes are obsolete. Um, they were used in uh, CRT monitors and televisions until a few years ago, but you don't see too many of those. But you probably do have a, a tube in at least one device in your home right now, and that would be your microwave oven. They typically still have a uh, klystron tube in them. So components are identified in different ways. There's um, various color codes um, for use for things like um, marking resistors and capacitors. I've shown some of the color codes here. There's some useful uh, references you can find on the internet for color codes. There's also some, um, some nice smartphone apps now that, that have a lot of um, references for kind of engineering things like color codes and conversion between different units. Uh, there's a particular Android app I've used called ElectroDroid that's quite nice and it's free. So typically parts are identified by some kind of identifier and their value, maybe the power rating, sometimes the, the voltage rating. And um, as I said, often uh, color codes are used uh, or different types of numeric codes. And in fact, as you get into the, some of the surface mount devices now, they're so small, there really may not be any marking on the device because it's just physically too small. I put a list here of some of the common uh, prefixes that are used for units in electronics. So these would be used for 
the units of measurement like um, volts and amps commonly use these prefixes. Uh, they're also used for the component values like resistance in ohms, um, capacitance in farads, so things like microfarads, mega ohms are pretty common. So tend to use multiples of, of 10 to the 3. These would be the common prefixes that are used. Kind of a pet peeve I have, I sometimes see people write uh, megahertz for millions of hertz in frequency with a small m, and that's actually um, means millihertz with a small m rather than a big m. Um, so it's important to use the right units there and the right prefixes. So I get in now some of the concepts of um, uh, low-level hardware. It'll help you understand some of the different types of interfaces and ports that we're talking about. So first I want to talk a little bit about digital versus analog. Um, so some of this is pretty straightforward. Digital um, circuits are ones where you represent values or numbers using uh, discrete voltages representing typically a zero or a one, true or false, um, and typically a range of voltages um, indicate whether something is true or false. So one of the standards for um, 5 volt TTL logic, anything from 0 to 0 0.4 volts is considered low or false. Anything 2.6 to 5 volts is considered true using that type of logic family. Okay, so um, analog, um, I think actually you missed a slide here about describing the analog. Okay, here we go. So an analog is where the, uh, the, um, you can represent values within a continuous range rather than just a one or a zero. Um, so there's, there's ways to convert between digital and analog, which are, is called digital to analog conversion, analog to digital conversion. Um, and there's some issues there where the conversion is not perfect. Um, so some of the key factors would be, in terms of how you convert, would be things like the, the sample rate, how often you sample a signal, um, typically in the samples per second, and then the size of the sample uh, in bits, which indicate how accurately the, or the size of the number that you're using for sampling. So a, an example would be um, audio CD, which is a digital format for sound. It uses a 16-bit sample size and a 44,100 bit per second sample rate. So I'll talk briefly here about some of the different terms that are used for different types of um, processors and chips. Um, the CPU is a central processing unit. That's the, the component within a computer that carries out instructions. And if you go far enough back, sometimes the CPU uh, may have been multiple chips or would have been one chip on its own. Um, but by the mid-70s, we had microprocessors where you could put the entire CPU on uh, a, a single chip, a single integrated circuit. Um, kind of the next step up is microcontrollers where you, you have a small computer on an entire integrated circuit that has a CPU and also has um, uh, some amount of memory and possibly some kind of input-output um, devices. Um, other terms used system on a chip is sort of a more powerful um, device that has all of the elements of computer on a single chip. Uh, some of the other concepts you may see, system on a module is another type of single board computer, uh, system in a package, uh, sometimes known as a multi-chip module, uh, is where you sometimes take a number of integrated circuits or chips and put them together in a single module. Uh, and some specialized types of processors, as you probably know, DSPs that are used for digital signal processing, um, are often available as a separate chip used in some applications. And GPUs are graphics processing units, um, often used for video. And, and these are pretty much ubiquitous now on just about any kind of uh, embedded system that has a display. Um, if you go back a few years, there was the concept of floating point units that was sometimes a separate chip that would do floating point calculations. These are now pretty much all integrated into the microprocessors. Uh, different types of memory, I think we're probably all familiar with RAM and ROM, uh, read, uh, random access memory and read-only memory. There's different technologies there. Um, the more recent type of memory would be flash memory, and there's a, a number of different types of flash as well that have slightly different characteristics. 
So I'll talk now a little bit about uh, concepts related to input output uh, devices and ports. Um, so it's probably pretty straightforward. You can have input uh, devices, you can have output devices, you can have pins that are bidirectional that can be inputs or outputs. And there are other variations that you can have of capability. So uh, some uh, I.O. channels could be tri-state where they basically you can um, go into a high impedance state and be disabled so it, it doesn't interfere with other circuitry connected to it. Uh, some I.O. ports can have pull up and pull down resistors to um, set the level that they're at when they're inactive. Uh, you have things like open collector outputs where you connect multiple outputs together. Um, and then at a high level, there's analog inputs and outputs and digital and something kind of a hybrid pulse width modulation that I'll cover in a later slide. So I'll talk now about some specific types of interfaces that are used um, on embedded systems of different types. Um, and some of the more commonly used ones we'll go into in a little bit more detail. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about programming for some of these more common ones. So probably one of the most common embedded systems is I squared C uh, or I2C, stands for inter-integrated circuit. Um, this is a, um, a protocol that's been defined originally invented by Philips Semiconductor, uh, where devices can communicate and you can have multiple devices on the same serial bus. Um, it's, it's, it's a relatively low speed interface um, that's often used for connecting different types of, of peripheral devices um, to a processor. Um, so it only uses uh, really two lines plus um, power. And so it's quite simple and uses typically either five volt or three volt um, logic, depending on the, the technology that you're using. So I'll cover a little bit about how this is programmed on embedded Linux systems in some later slides. Uh, another related one is SMB bus system management bus. Um, this is something that's derived from I squared C. Um, that's kind of a subset of I squared C that's been standardized. And it's a similar type of interface that's used for um, communicating between different devices. On a, on a desktop PC, this is typically used for some of the power management circuitry um, at a low level for controlling um, things like power management and sleep mode on your PC. Uh, so this was defined by Intel a number of years ago. Another common was SPI, serial peripheral interface, uh, sometimes called SSI. Uh, this is another um, relatively low speed interface uh, using just four wires. Um, and like the other, it's, it's serial. Um, this is supported by a lot of different types of uh, input output sensor devices. And uh, you can have multiple devices on the same bus and select the ones that you want to talk to. Another very common one now is, is what's called GPIO or general purpose IO and not a lot of designs rather than having dedicated um, I squared C or SPI uh, pins, you have more uh, general purpose pins that they can be used and programmed in different ways. Um, so that's what, what this stands for. You can typically use the um, pins as inputs or outputs. Um, often they support other features that I mentioned like tri-state um, and some of these can be configured as well for things like serial and I squared C. So these are things you commonly see on some of the embedded boards, which I'll, I'll mention later, uh, things like the Arduino and the Beetle Bones and the Raspberry Pi. This is a picture incidentally of a Raspberry Pi and the, uh, on the bottom right there, the connectors are mostly GPIO pins. So some of the other common interfaces, um, USB, I think everybody's familiar with. Uh, the latest spec is 3.1. Um, sometimes it's used just for power as a convenient way for 5 volt power. Uh, I'll mention a few things later when I talk about some gotchas, some things to watch for with hardware related to USB. Uh, a few other interfaces. Some of these are a little older. Um, this one, the IEEE 488, also known as GPIB. Um, that should be GPIB, General Purpose Interface Bus, and HPIB. This is... Um, 
was mainly used um, going back to the 60s, but still used today uh, for automated test equipment made from companies like Hewlett Packard. And that's where the original HPIB came from um, for controlling instruments like voltmeters and signal generators and things like that. Um, use very large, expensive cables. So today they've mostly been replaced. Um, most of the instruments support more common um, higher speed interfaces like USB and FireWire and Ethernet, things like that. Another standard is Modbus. It's another serial protocol um, often used when you're controlling things like um, PLCs um, in industrial systems, sometimes called SCADA systems, uh, where you can talk to many devices uh, in a network. <coughs> and then we have serial ports. Uh, most people are probably familiar with um, serial ports. <coughs> The most well-known RS-232, where you're sending a bit at a time, uh, it's asynchronous, so it starts and stops uh, depending on when it's being used. <clears throat> so there are the, the uh, two sides communicating the degree on the baud rate and the uh, data bits, uh, number of start and stop bits in parity. So RS-232 uses voltage levels that, that can vary from 3 to 15 volts. Um, RS-422 is a variant of that. It uses what's called differential signaling, so you can go a longer distance. Uh, RS-485 is a, is a version of the standard where you can have multiple devices. Um, in, on, it's pretty common on modern PCs now that you no longer have serial ports, so uh, the most common solution is um, a USB to serial converter uh, that you, you plug into a USB port. Um, and there's a number of USB devices that appear as serial devices using things like the well-known FTDI chipset. Um, so I'll mention a few gotchas later related to serial ports. Um, it is common to find serial ports on embedded boards. For example, sometimes there'll be a serial console that you can use, and often that is not at, at RS-232 levels, but would be at um, whatever voltage level the circuit uses, like 5 volt or 3.3 volts. So that's something where you, you're going to need a, an adapter if you want to connect it to a RS-232 port. A few other interface types. Uh, parallel ports can be a, sort of a general term that talks about um, ports with multiple data bits as opposed to a, a single bit serial. And so typically there's a number of data lines and some handshaking lines. Um, going back a few years, parallel ports often referred to a particular standard on PCs that were originally was a printer port, um, but also was used as a bidirectional kind of parallel port on, on older printers, but that's mostly obsolete today. Another standard you may come across is JTAG. This is uh, it's actually the name of a standards group that comes from uh, testing. Um, but this is the, the common name for what's called the IEEE standard 1149.1. Um, it's also known as boundary scan. Uh, this really came out of a number of years ago as components became more complex and uh, they were moving to surface mount technology. A lot of testing relies on getting access to test points and with um, very integrated um, chips and surface mount, you no longer really had access to test points on a board. So this boundary scan was a, a technique where you could get visibility to test points within a board or within an integrated circuit. So you could do testing, typically for manufacturing testing. Um, out of that was, uh, they were also were used for debugging um, so you could do things like uh, single stepping and, and setting breakpoints for your processor using this boundary scan protocol. Um, and so in the past where you might have taken the CPU out of a socket or clipped onto it with some kind of a um, uh, emulator or a, a analyzer, um, today a lot of this can be done through a JTAG interface. So a few more interfaces, there's something called one wire. Um, sometimes called Dallas One Wire because it was designed by Dallas Semiconductor. It's a, a low speed uh, serial interface, something similar to I squared C. Uh, there's a lot of inexpensive sensor type devices that can use this. Um, and that's actually two wires. It's not, it's, it's not just one wire. You have the data and ground. 
but somewhat interesting in that the device is powered by the data line. Um, this is also being used for data communications. Uh, some of these protocols like this one, you can support by what's called bit banging, where given a, a, a general purpose um, I.O. port, you can implement the protocol in software. Um, so this would be one that you could commonly implement on a GPIO pin using bit banging. Um, on Linux, there are some uh, utilities like the one wire file system that provides um, the ability to, to support this protocol using bit banging, so you don't have to do it all yourself. Uh, a little bit about displays. Um, there's various types. One of the really common ones is for uh, simple text LCD displays. Um, it's HD44780 has become kind of a de facto standard for uh, low cost LCD displays. Uh, typically two lines by 16 characters or sometimes up to 80 characters. And um, it's, a, it's, it's a reasonably simple interface with 16 connectors, but the devices are somewhat intelligent in that you're basically sending them like uh, ASCII characters to display. And there, there's different drivers available for these on operating systems for like Linux if you want to control one. So something like this is really easy to control and something like a Raspberry Pi. Uh, MIDI is kind of an older interface uh, that was used for electronic uh, musical instruments and sometimes lighting. Um, many people may think of this as a music file format, which is also part of the standard. Um, for MIDI, but the full standard actually specified a hardware protocol and connectors and things like that. Another one is the PC keyboard. Uh, sometimes if in, on embedded devices you want to plug in a keyboard and a good solution can be supporting a standard PC type keyboard. And these have kind of evolved over the years from the original PC that used a five pin DIN connector to the PS2 that used a smaller six pin connector uh, and today, pretty much um, everyone's using USB type um, keyboards. The first two are pretty simple protocols, and you can actually implement these in software with uh, things like GPIO ports if you want to have the ability to talk to a, a keyboard, maybe just for um, debug or development purposes. So I, I mentioned PWM or pulse width modulation. This is um, um, a technique where you vary the duty cycle of pulses on I.O. ports, and this can be used for type of digital to analog conversion um, with a little bit of external circuitry. There's some types of devices that use PWM for controlling them. Um, so you can often do this with GPIO pins, and some devices have direct support for doing PWM in hardware. Um, rather doing entirely in software. So an example would be the Raspberry Pi some of the GPIO pins can do PWM. Um, in fact, I've seen a, a demonstration where you, they generated FM radio signals entirely in software on a Raspberry Pi using PWM. And simply just a, a short wire coming off of the GPIO pin as an antenna, and you could transmit uh, uh, FM radio signals to a nearby radio. Uh, some other interfaces for devices. Stepper motors are a type of um, motor that rather than spinning, you can control the rotation by stepping them through uh, small discrete steps, maybe a one degree, half a degree. Um, so this allows you to control the position of something with a, quite a simple interface. Um, there's a few different types, and typically you need circuitry that can drive these because they, they may need a significant amount of current. Um, this is the type of thing that we're used, um, it's used in hard drives and floppy drives. And some of the platforms like the Arduino that I'll mention have direct support for controlling uh, stepper motors. Uh, another related one, um, servo motors, these sort of come out of the uh, hobby market for radio control for controlling position. Um, it's a, they're very low cost today. Um, motors which can be controlled for actuating things, um, sometimes used for smaller robotics type applications. And it's a simple three wire interface um, where you have power and you have a control pin that's controlled using a pulse width modulation. Uh, this is also supported in Arduino. In fact, you can, you can directly plug a few servos into an Arduino without any other circuitry. 
A couple of other interfaces, DSI and CSI, are serial interfaces for displays, LCD displays, and cameras. Uh, these come out of some standards by um, a group called MIPI and the MIPI Alliance. Uh, are commonly used for LCD displays and um, low-cost cameras. These are available on a Raspberry Pi, for example. There's connectors for the, um, the MIPI and um, DSI and CSI interfaces. In the Raspberry Pi, there's an official camera module that plugs into the CSI interface. And usually the purpose of a lot of these interfaces is to talk to some kind of sensor. Um, and there's a huge number of different types of sensors and related devices. So there's things like infrared transmitters and receivers. There's many different sensors for different types of physical values for things like temperature, uh, light intensity, air pressure, humidity, um, radiation, sound. Um, then you have all types of accelerometers, which are common now in a lot of embedded devices and smartphones. And then various types of output devices like um, LEDs, sound, uh, motion, uh, GPS. Um, so a lot of these will use common interfaces like I squared C or simple digital pins or maybe analog pins. Uh, briefly about displays, there's a whole range of displays starting from really simple light emitting diodes, uh, which can be discrete LEDs to bar graphs like the picture here, to um, alphanumeric type, um, right up to um, LCDs with uh, either text or bitmap graphics, and then you get into full video that we're probably mostly familiar with, um, VGA, HDMI, things like that. Let me say a little bit about real-time. Real um, often on embedded systems, you have to do some, some kind of real-time processing. And um, real-time systems are kind of classified into two categories of real-time systems. Um, so you have hard real-time systems where um, the timing is critical. And if something isn't done within a particular time deadline, it's considered a failure of the system. Uh, then you have the so-called soft real-time systems that have some real-time requirements, but the system can accommodate some um, uh, degradation of service if, if you miss the deadline at least some of the time. Um, so there are real-time operating systems or RTOSs that support hard real-time at the operating system level. Um, Linux is not a RTOS, at least standard Linux. Um, so I'll talk about some of the, the options if you need a hard real-time system. Um, So on some non-RTOS systems like uh, Linux and other POSIX-based systems, there are some facilities for controlling the priority of processes and the scheduling algorithm. So that sometimes can be adequate, um, maybe making the process a higher priority or um, playing with the way the scheduler works. Um, so there's some system calls you can do on Linux and POSIX systems. Um, another approach is if you have some real-time requirements, you can implement that in the kernel where you have tighter control of what's happening um, and what other processes are doing. There are some add-ons for operating systems like Linux that give you hard real-time capability, so that's another solution. And then you can go to a true RTOS, something like QNX, that has support for hard real-time right at the OS level. Uh, and finally, another option is to offload the real-time stuff to another processor, like a microcontroller or a, a PIC chip. Uh, so that can be another good solution as well. Let's look briefly at some of the embedded development platforms that are out there. There's, there's uh, many of these, literally hundreds of different embedded platforms from different vendors. Most of the vendors have uh, evaluation boards for the different chipsets that they offer. Uh, I'll just talk about a few of the, the more low-cost popular ones. Uh, the Raspberry Pi is probably well known to a lot of people. It really came out of um, a, a platform for education, for teaching kids about programming, but it makes a good embedded platform. Uh, very low cost, it's an ARM processor, uh, runs a lot of different operating systems and has quite a bit um, of hardware built on board. Um, and it's priced starting at $25. Um, most people are looking at a Model B for $35. It's a complete system with uh, half a gigabyte of RAM and, and USB ports. Um, 
Recently, they introduced the Model B Plus. It has a few improvements now. The power uh, consumption is a little lower. It has more USB ports, uh, more GPI GPIO ports. Uh, they also introduced something recently called the Compute Module, which is a little more suitable if you're building a product and you don't necessarily need the form factor or the devices that are built into a regular Raspberry Pi. So this is a, um, uh, a module that can plug into a DIMM socket where typically we go on some kind of a carrier board where you'd, you'd um, add additional hardware that's custom for your application. Another family is the Beagle boards and the Beagle bones. These come from um, TI, partnered with some of the, ma the manufacturers, distributors, DigiKey and, and Farnell Element 14. Uh, this is an ARM processor. Uh, there's various models. Um, it comes with pretty much all the common interfaces that you might want. It's got accelerated video. Um, and these are a little more than the Raspberry Pi, but they could get down to about the same price level on the low end. So there's a number of models of the Beagle board and Beagle bone. Um, and these also will run a number of different operating systems. Um, they have connectors, as you see there, for adding additional, hard on, uh, additional modules for different types of hardware interfaces. Uh, these are similar to the uh, Arduino shields that I'll mention on, on the, in the BeagleBone world, they call these capes. Uh, Intel has a number of offerings. Uh, I just listed a few here. There's the Nuke, which is a, a small form factor PC, which is what you see on the bottom there. They have um, some Galileo boards. Uh, these are actually compatible with the Arduino that I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. Um, the Edison series, some of them are aimed at, at wearable computers. Uh, the Minnow board's a low-cost um, uh, x86 compatible Atom board. And TI also has a number of offerings. This is just one of their um, ARM-based um, development boards. We actually, at the ICS booth here at the show, we've got a couple of these running QNX. Uh, running a uh, cute application on the built-in uh, LCD and touchscreen. So the Arduino is, a, is another a really popular embedded computer. It's, um, it's more of a microcontroller. It isn't running a full uh, operating system like Linux. Um, there's a range of them. I think at last count, there's about 15 different Arduino boards, 15 official ones. There's a lot of uh, compatibles and clones. Um, then these are more for low-level programming that don't really have an operating system as such, but they're um, very easy to use for embedded uh, microcontroller type applications. Um, so really they combined a number of nice features with the Arduino that's made them uh, extremely popular uh, with people who want to do microcontroller type applications. So first of all, the cost is really low. Some of these are under $10. Um, they're really easy to, to program. In the past, it sometimes can be hard to set up the, some of the IDs for embedded systems. This has a very simple IDE that within a few minutes, you can hook this thing up um, and connect it to the device. You just need a USB cable to connect to the Arduino. You don't need any kind of uh, fancy programmer. Um, and the programming is, um, is based on C++. It's actually slightly simplified version where they're using a preprocessor to make the programming a little easier. And there's a, a huge community out there with many examples of different types of programs and libraries that you can leverage. Um, and typically, it comes with a lot of inputs, outputs on the different boards. And there's this concept of shields that you can plug into the Arduino to add more hardware. Um, so here's a simple code example. This is a complete program that you could compile and um, download to an Arduino. This is sort of the um, um, Hello World equivalent in the embedded system, which is the first program people normally write is to get an LED to flash. Um, so literally, this is all the code you need on the machine um, to program it, and it gets programmed into the flash on the device. So. Sometimes if you have an application where you need some kind of real-time um, processing or low-level processing, but you also want some higher-level functionality, uh, a good solution can be to combine an Arduino with an um, embedded computer like a Linux-based system and let the Arduino do some of the low-level, low real-time stuff, in, in, but then still have a full-function embedded Linux system.
So in, in the Qt toolkit, as you probably know, there are some uh, modules that you sort of fit in the category of low-level hardware. Uh, so I won't really cover those in detail. Most people are probably familiar with these, but Qt has direct support for serial ports, networking, uh, Bluetooth, and, and some location positioning type APIs and sensors. So in the category of low-level programming, some of that is directly supported by Qt on a lot of platforms. Um, going to quickly go over how some of the more common interfaces uh, are programmed under embedded Linux. Um, and you typically have a few different options of how you do this. There's typically user space um, access to these devices, but another option is to do your programming within the kernel um, where you have a little more control of what's happening, but the programming is a little more difficult environment. Uh, so I squared C, which is one of the real common ones, um, uh, Linux has uh, kernel level drivers for I squared C, so kind of fitting into the Unix philosophy, um, the I squared C interfaces look like uh, standard character devices, and they show up under the slash dev file system under dev I2C with a, a number based on the adapter number. Um, there's some add on utilities that you probably want to install if you're going to be working with I2, uh, I squared C. Um, it's a package called I2C Tools. Uh, comes with some utilities that are useful for development and debugging, like one that will detect the different ports that you've got. Uh, so basically, you can program the I2C using standard system calls, things like open, uh, IOCTL, read and write, as well as the, the those kernel system calls. There are some um, higher level functions. Um, defined in Linux header files. This particular one is for SMB bus, which is a subset of I squared C. Um, so there's specific uh, SM bus uh, functions that you can call um, at the kernel driver level as well. And this is all documented as part of the Linux kernel. Um, a couple tips on I squared C. On some platforms, you may need to manually load the I squared C drivers using mod probe. And you may need to set the permissions if, if you want to run as non-root. Uh, that's something you could set up in a, in a init script if you wanted to automate it. Um, so the bottom link there is uh, some of the uh, documentation on the, the I2C interface from the Linux kernel.org. Uh, SPI I mentioned earlier, that's another one. Um, and it's similar in that under embedded Linux, they show up as character devices um, under slash dev. Uh, with a name based on the bus and the um, uh, chip select number. Um, so you can do programming within user space to um, access different SPI devices, basically using read and write, and you have some control over the interfaces using IC IOCTL calls. So this talks about some things you can do, basically reading and writing. There's some restrictions on what you can do from user space. Uh, and that's also documented on, on the standard kernel documentation that's at kernel org and, and many other sites. Um, so in GPIO, um, there's the different boards have different types of GPIO interfaces, different chipsets, but Linux has tried to abstract that into a unified driver so that they, they all appear somewhat the same. Um, so typically, these GPIO pins can be used for simple digital input-output. Um, some of them support I2C, SPI, um, uh, maybe a UART, depending on the hardware capabilities. Um, so typically, on a per-pin basis, you can define whether it's an input or an output. You can read inputs. You can write to the outputs and control some of the options that the hardware might have uh, for things like uh, pull-up resistors. Um, so typically, you, you may have to change the permissions on the devices in slash dev uh, if you're not running as root. Uh, this is documented again on kernel.org. And there's a few different ways you can do um, GPIO. Um, so the first would be the kernel system calls, uh, where there's specific GPIO uh, kernel calls that you can make from a user space program. Um, and just a note, there is a, sort of an older integer-based interface, and there's also a newer uh, descriptor-based interface, so it's preferred to use the, the latter one. The second way you can do it is uh, under the sysfs file system. Um, 
you'll see GPIO devices show up under Sys class GPIO. And this is done just by manipulating these um, pseudo device files. Um, so typically the way it works, you need to export a pin to indicate that you want to use it by writing the pin number to Sys class GPIO export. And then you'll then see a device appear under Sys class GPIO GPIO N with the number of the pin. Um, so when you're finished working with a with a particular pin, you can unexport it, and make that available to um, other applications, other processes. Uh, so then you can then write to a direction file under sysf sysfs to indicate whether you want this to be an input or output pin. And then if, if it's an output, you can write a zero to one to a sysfs file uh, for that pin, and you can read the value using a, a, another similar uh, device file. There's also some information under sys class GPIO about the actual controllers that you have on your system. Um, so here's an example where it actually a shell script that would work on a Raspberry Pi where it's, it can be as simple as just um, writing um, information to these device files. So you can even do it as simple as a, as a um, shell script. The um, third method would be memory mapped where um, on some platforms like Raspberry Pi, the um, GPIO memory is, or GPIO hardware is memory mapped and you can map that into your user process by calling uh, mmap on dev mem and get basically a pointer to the actual hardware and then um, work with pointers to the hardware. So this is really fast, um, but it's a little more messy as you're working with pointers to different devices. But typically there's some macro set up to help you make sense of the memory mapping of that particular device. So this is used a lot on the Raspberry Pi. The final way would be you could you could write a kernel driver specific to your device if you wanted. This would give you the maximum flexibility in terms of controlling the devices. Um, particularly if you want to do things like IRQ handling, interrupt handling. Uh, but typically writing kernel code is, is about an order of magnitude harder than user space code. Um, it's harder to debug and if, if, if you crash the driver, then you may crash the entire machine. So it's a lot harder to, to, uh, to implement. There's also licensing issues with writing kernel drivers uh, to comply with the, uh, the kernel licensing. Uh, so I'm, I'm running short on time here, so I'm going to gloss over some of the other slides. There's various libraries available for GPIO uh, to make it easier. There's one in particular here that's compatible with the Arduino, so you can um, port code from an Arduino over and essentially source compatible with the uh, Arduino libraries. Um, so getting back more to hardware, um, some tips. Uh, if you're going to be assembling hardware, putting things together, you probably get some basic tools um, that are suitable for, for hardware. Um, some of that would be soldering equipment if you're going to be doing any soldering. Um, and, and soldering is actually not that hard. Um, there's some proper technique and takes some practice, but um, it's something that is definitely doable. Even surface mount technology, now people are doing uh, hand soldering, some of the larger parts. And if you're really ambitious, you can even do what's called reflow soldering using a reasonably simple setup with a toaster oven and a temperature controller. Um, some basic test equipment, uh, digital multimeters are kind of the most common thing. They're, they're really cheap. Some of them are under $10 uh, US. Um, depending on your budget, you may want to um, get uh, more sophisticated things ranging up to an oscilloscope so you can see directly see signals in the, in the time domain. Uh, so I've listed here some useful components uh, of test equipment that you might want to look at. Um, so running short on time, I'm going to skip ahead. It could be useful to have uh, some spare parts available depending on what you're working on. Um, general suggestion if you want to get into embedded systems, I'd suggest you get um, one or more of the low-cost boards like a Raspberry Pi uh, and or an Arduino. Spend some time with it. Get the development tools set up. Start with the uh, flashing LED program and then maybe work on some more sophisticated programs. This example here is a Raspberry Pi with a little breadboard um, shield that fits on it and the, the white device at the top is a uh, humidity and temperature sensor 
So um, really just a few wires and a, a sensor that you can experiment with uh, measuring temperature and humidity. Uh, and you can easily do similar things with other sensors. Um, there's a number of different const hardware construction methods. I don't really have time to go through all these. Uh, maybe mention some of the gotchas that I talked about before. Um, Older systems tend to work on 5 volt logic. Some of the new ones are 3.3 volt. That can be uh, something to be aware of if you start mixing um, the wrong devices together. You can damage them. Uh, serial ports, uh, there's issues with different connectors and voltage levels. Um, even USB ports, there can be confusion. And some of the devices now have what look like USB ports that are only used for power and have other ports that are used for, uh, for data. So again, close to the end here, some references. There's, there's many, many websites on hardware and electronics. I mentioned only just a few here. Uh, the first is a, a, a YouTube site and, and website that I really like that's got a lot of um, hardware um, videos. Uh, there's another site, Hackaday, that has a lot of interesting uh, hardware projects. And even Wikipedia if you, is a useful resource. If you want to look up some of these different interfaces like I2C, um, they've got some good references for that. Um, there's a number of books out there. A good introductory one um, is this uh, Make Electronics that's published by Make Magazine. It's got a really good introduction to electronics and some different projects that you can do. Um, they also have a related Make Magazine that, that has a lot of projects that are electronics related and, and cover things like the Arduinos. Um, and then part suppliers, these are some of the common hardware parts and test equipment suppliers, they they tend to be country specific. So in any given country, one of them, some of them are more um, suitable. So it, it, that's uh, really wraps things up. Uh, thanks for watching. I've got a few minutes that we could uh, try and take some questions from the audience if you have any, I'll see if I can answer them. Hi, I found um, the idea of writing an uh, own kernel driver for um, getting to those GBIO ports. Very interesting. Is there a, a good starting point where to uh, get acquainted with, um, with this technique? How to start this? Uh, so the question, is it writing a kernel driver a good place to start? I I would start with user space programming because the kernel development is, is more difficult, unless you're already familiar with kernel development in general. Um, but I would start with the, like the user space programming. But if you wanted to look at kernel level, then that would be a good later step. Maybe look at some of the existing drivers. Yeah, hello. First, uh, thanks. It was very interesting. Uh, and was just wondering, uh, you pointed out a, a lot of details, uh, especially regarding Linux. Um, is there any kind of abstraction layer for Qt to uh, abstract more for, from the actual hardware and some? Yeah, I think um, really currently it's just some of the modules I mentioned like serial ports and um, locationing and, and some of the and networking, but there, there's not too many other low-level uh, I, APIs that cute abstracts, but I think there's some good opportunities there to, for people to look at areas that that would make sense to get them in cute. Um, because on some of the other platforms, the, the, the interfaces are a little different um, from embedded Linux. So I think there's some opportunities there down the road for people to do that. I'd like to see some um, contributions to that. Thanks. Are there any other questions? Then I think we can close this. Thank you. Okay.